introduce us, our team. Uh, I'm Keaton uh, from Larson Gross. I oversee our nonprofit practice and work with North Sound. And also here is Brittany and Orion from Larson Gross. And we'll be, today we're gonna be talking about a few things. We're specifically gonna hone in on PPP, uh, but also got some slides to share with you on the employee retention credit, uh, the lesser known uh, option that just got a lot sweeter when retroactively you could begin using that as well as PPP. It's a little bit of presentation, but uh, mostly get, want to give you information and then answer questions, either ones that come up or that you've brought to the meeting and, and we'll go from there and see where it takes us. So I'm going to start sharing my screen and let Ryan, jump in here just a minute, all right? Oh, Ryan, is that what you are hoping to see? Did I share the right screen? Uh, yeah, perfect. Thanks, Keaton. All right, cool. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I guess just to kick off, um, overall, is anybody has anybody dealt with the PPP loan yet? Um, if you have, so this would be, sounds like I'm just looking at the screen. A couple people are saying no right now. So this might be a brand new program for you. Um, so I'll kind of just go over it broadly. And then like Keaton said, we can just kind of go over questions about it and kind of dive into it a little bit more. Um, so it is part of a, so the PPP came out last year in March of 2020, the original one. And the funds were depleted uh, through, I think it was about August or September, maybe a little later. And then they re, re up this program. So they are allowing it again for applicants. Um, and applicants can be across the board. It can be businesses that are for profit and nonprofit. And there's another program that's available now until March 31st. And it is part of this December 27th uh, COVID relief package. So PPP funding two, we can um, dive into this. $284 billion is allocated. So this really, this program is really intended for employers to keep their employees. That's the whole intention of it. So it's called Payroll Protection Program, PPP. And so the federal government is trying to keep employers, again, to keep their employees. And so that is what the intention is. And so right now there's about $284 billion out there in the original bill. And it's, it's only right now, there's probably about half that left. Um, so let's just say about 140 billion remaining. And that the program is available to first draw borrowers and eligible second draw borrowers. Um, most entity types with nonprofits in, in there as well. And the maximum loan amount is $10 million or $2 million if it's your second draw. And so it's a limited time thing. It's only going to be available until March 31st or until funding is available. And um, it's unknown at, right at this point if it's going to be extended. So it could be extended. We might know about it in the next couple of weeks, or it could be depleted by um, the end of the month here. And so right now, there's actually a little, little window of a for very small uh, companies under 20 employees that the SBA has allowed for processing loans. So after March 9th, it'll be open again to um, all employers again that have less than 500 employees or 300 for a second draw borrowers. Um, so if if you're if you are a nonprofit or a company that had PPP the first time, you would be considered a second draw applicant. And in that case, there would be a, a couple different hurdles you'd have to do to apply again. Um, first is, oh yes, so let's just go back here. We got a question. Can you go back one screen to the March 9th timing? Um, so the, the SBA announced about a week ago that they wanted to allow small businesses the opportunity to have an exclusive window where they could apply. Um, you know, a lot of, you know, bigger companies have more resources, so they've been able to capture these loans at a quicker rate than smaller companies. So they put a pause on this for the bigger ones. And any, any employers that have more than 20 employees are basically having to wait until March 9th and they can apply again with the SBA. And it's through your lender. So if you were to apply, you could do it, but the SBA just won't process the application until after March 9th. Um, 
Okay, so for a uh, for, for for a second draw borrower, there's a little bit of a hurdle, and I'm not sure how many we have in that case. But if you're a second draw borrower, you have a 25 percent gross decrease in a quarter from 2019 to 2020. So let's say Q2 of 2020 dropped 25 percent versus Q2 of 2019, and that would be a qualifying um, qualifying quarter. And in that case, you could go for a second draw PP. Now the loan, how is it calculated? I mean, it, it depends on the entity type and it depends on the industry. Um, the industry is probably only going to apply here for restaurants and hospitality. So that might not apply for, for a lot of you, but the entity type would be depending on um, your tax filing code. So tax filing your partnership or if you're a nonprofit doing a 990 or C Corp, et cetera. So that would, that would drive the calculation. Um, and it's dependent on your actually your payroll costs. So your W-2 payroll costs. And you take an aggregation of your, your basically your full year for all your employees in 2020 or 2019. And then you take that and you get a two and a half monthly average. And that's the loan amount. There's a couple other items that go in there, but that's generally what the loan amount would be. Um, and the loan is a 1% interest. It's what the SBA it's five years, and that is if it's not forgiven. And that's a, a really good point to just to highlight. You know, we've a lot of organizations, nonprofits especially, will look at this and say, you know, well, what's the, what are the chances uh, it'll be forgiven? And for a long time now, we've been able to say, well, very likely. Um, but even if some's not, this is a unheard of uh, type loan with that low of an interest rate. That's right, yep. And you do get a deferment of, I'm not sure the exact timing, but it's at least at least six months after you get those proceeds that, that you don't have any payments at that point. And so it, you get a deferment of, of, of not having to do any payments. And then after that point, you go through the forgiveness process. So what is the forgiveness process? So it is something called a covered period. And that means the covered period is, so you apply for the loan, you, so you receive it, that date that the proceeds are available, that kicks off the covered period. And that covered period is basically going to, so let's just say March 1st, you get those loans. Then you have an eight to 24 four week window to use those proceeds. And those proceeds would need to be used towards um, payroll costs. So that's the intention of the whole program, right? So you need to put at least 60% of those proceeds to payroll costs and then uh, the other 40% or less can be used for um, other eligible costs. So like utilities, mortgage interest, rent, um, even uh, what is it? personal protection from the COVID situation. Um, there's, there's supplies necessary in operation. So there's, so basically the government wants you to use these. You can't just take a, you know, take that money and give someone a huge bonus to one employee, get capped at $100,000 per you know, employee annualized. So it's really, the intention is to put this back in your, to your, your operations, use it for your employees, keep your payroll up, keep your employees employed. So, that, so that's how the forgiveness part is. So that's what Keaton said, it's pretty likely you could get forgiven. And it's, if you meet these requirements, then that loan can be forgiven. We've had a lot of clients that are in that situation. Um, another thing is it's not subject to federal income taxation. So that was one of the December clarifications that came out is we didn't know if this was gonna be subject to federal taxation or have any impact and it's not. So it's, it's a once in a very rare thing where you get money from the government, it's not gonna be taxed. Uh, question for you, Orion. So was the first round, was it eight or 24 weeks? And this That's one is right. two, is that a difference? Exactly. Yep. That's exactly a difference there. So before they were more regimented where you had an eight or 24 week window or so this is much more flexible. You can use those 16, 12, et cetera weeks. And that gives you more flexibility to, to also get your employee count up as well. Cause the loan forgiveness also does, we have it in the appendix, but there's some other factors there as well since the uh, employee count. So you, let's say you get those loan proceeds on March 1st, you have 10 employees. But then by the time, say eight weeks are up, you're in May 1st and you only have four employees. So you have half the employees. So 
that would impact the loan forgiveness calculation because the intention is to keep those employee counts up. So that eight to 24 week window, what would happen is you get those, that loan and then you'd basically wait 24 weeks and then you'd look at those, that whole time period between eight to 24 weeks and figure out the time, the best time to have that loan forgiveness count go through based on the payroll data, full time employee count, et cetera. So what are the, the next steps here? So it's pretty limited time period again. So the first thing is figuring out if your entity that you're, that you're a part of is a first time or second time PPP applicant. If it is a second time loan, um, then you need to calculate the gross revenue decrease and have that documentation available for your lender. The other thing is gather documentation for the payroll costs, um, 2019 or 2020. So you need those, the Form 941s, the federal tax form, the payroll statements. So most clients that, we've, that I've worked with on this, you know, 2019 is the better year most of the time. Usually the payroll is higher that time. Another thing is from an administrative standpoint, you'd have to submit the 2019 tax return or 2020 tax return with your lender. Now we're in March. And so not all the tax returns obviously could be done for 2020 and submit to your lender. So that's why the 2019 has more appeal in that way. Um, and yeah, March 31st is the deadline. I would say it probably takes a week or so to get this whole thing gathered up and, and out the door. And so um, I would say it's, it's pretty, pretty good timing right now to, to start thinking about this. Any closing PPP thoughts? Do we wanna take some questions before diving into tax credit? Yeah, I'm definitely open to questions. So if, if, if anybody um, has a question now, or I'm definitely hanging around and uh, see if there's any questions that come up better. Yeah, Susan. Thank you. Uh, I had a question come up that you may or may not be able to answer it, and I'll try to make it quick because it probably doesn't apply to anyone else. But I do have a Whatcom County employee you know, we're a Bellingham business, but she lives in White Rock. So White Rock is her principal place of business. And I understand the funds can't be used to pay her salary. The PPP funds can't be used to pay her salary. But do I include her salary when I do the calculation for the two and a half months? In other words, so, so is White Rock that is, is in Canada or US? Canada. Canada. Okay. So, so, yep. So if you, so, in that case, you would have to be a U.S. resident to qualify. Um, so a, one of the, sorry, a, what was that? She's a dual resident. She's U.S. and Canada. She's dual resident. Is there so the primary residence is it in the U.S. or Canada? In Canada. And let me clarify, okay. Ryan. Um, this employee is doing the work. It sounds like in Canada. No, not, not eligible for. Uh, no. Doing the work. But when you're calculating the two and a half months, should right. that should that salary be in there? Uh, I would say no. I would exclude it because um, on the actual application, it will say um, primary residence in the U.S. And so in that in that case, I would exclude exclude that employee. Um, even though she probably has W two wages as well, I'd, I would assume too. But um, but yeah, I would I'd probably probably exclude that based upon you know, primary residence. Um, right, case. right. Her residence is in Canada. She's a U.S. and Canadian citizen. She files a U.S. tax return. She gets a W-2, but she lives in Canada. So I'll take my 2019 uh, payroll total, deduct her wages before I divide by 12 and multiply by 2.5. Is that correct? That's right. And yeah, that that's what I would do. Yeah, and that won't cause them any problem that I am reporting a number that is significantly less than what is on the 941s. That's right. Yep, I would have I would have that exact calculation you said. I would have that documented and then include that with everything. Thank you so much. Yeah, you bet. All right. Then I'm going to turn it over to Brittany. Talk about some tax credit. Yeah, so um, as Keaton alluded to earlier, as of December 27th, 2020, we are now able to entertain the idea of the employee tension for credit. 
So if you recall back in 2020, when the pandemic hit, PPP and ERC were oil and water. You could not mix them. You had to pick and choose. And most organizations chose PPP because it was kind of cash now. It was an immediate relief for the devastation that was happening. However, in December, the IRS came back and said, we need to support our small businesses or organizations more. And so we're going to retroactively go back and allow individuals who took PPP to do the employee retention credit. So for 2020, the employee retention credit is a credit on payroll wages that is applied to payroll tax payments. So through your EFTPS payments that you're making for your 941. And so to be eligible um, for the credit, you had to have a partial or government shutdown or a gross receipts decline that started in March 12th um, through the end of the year. And so the original ERC, which still holds today, is that you could use wages that were not counted for the PPP up to $10,000. So if you had an employee that made $20,000 and say you attributed $10,000 to PPP, you are now able to attribute $10,000 to ERC. The $10,000 max wage allows you to get a maximum credit of $5,000 or less, depending on the wages that you are qualifying. So employers, including not-for-profits such as yourself, are eligible for the credit because you are deemed by the IRS to have a trader business. So when we look at your gross receipts, it's contributions and um, gifts and grants and things like that that we they use as your, your trade of business. And so as a reminder for ERC, unlike PPP, you do have to qualify. So you have to have a full or partial suspension of operations, meaning that a government official such as the governor has shut down your operations, meaning nothing could happen from a, for a full shutdown. For a partial suspension, we can look at your organization and which verticals were affected in order to see if you qualify. Um, the easiest example, not being a not-for-profit, but a restaurant. Think of a restaurant. They could not dine in. They could only do takeout. And so they had a nominal decrease of sales because of the dine-in. Um, but travel meetings, not having your clients being there would all qualify you for a partial suspension. If you had none of that and you were able to pivot your business and your organization to continue working through teleworking, um, remote work, computers, um, then we can try to do a qualification based on gross receipts. So in 2020, you had to have a gross receipts decline of 50% in a quarter compared to 2019, and you were eligible until you reached 80%. So the idea was that you would drop for a point of time and then you would regain, regain momentum. Uh, next slide. Let me jump in for just a sec. Sure. Just to, just to clarify, so um the the retention credit the erc has the you must qualify for it similar to the ppp2 it's a different it's not exactly the same test it's the ppp1 uh that was more just you said you need it and you didn't have to qualify for it um and then also one of the things i've seen a lot of nonprofits um who got the ppp round one um as they're going through the forgiveness process uh, struggle with is yeah, okay, you could do payroll and you could do other costs, a portion of those other costs. Well, over 24 weeks, most organizations were just going to go with uh, the payroll cost because it's easy. We had, we had plenty to put in on those 24 weeks to get full forgiveness. Um, if you've not already got your forgiveness on round one, this all of a sudden makes it much more important to think about what you're putting through PPP because if you have other costs, you want to put those through PPP because that creates more of a pool to take advantage of this ERC. All right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So just to recap, because this is a lot. So um, we do with this in December, they did issue a retroactive ERC for 2020, and they also issued a 2021 guidance. And so this table, I wanted to be able to summarize for you the differences. Um, because as Keaton has alluded to, there are qualifications, maximums, and minimums involved. 
So if you are entertaining the idea of retroactively going back and looking at your 941s and you have not filed your PPP forgiveness, remember that your gross receipts need to be 50% or less from the previous quarter if you did not have a partial or government shutdown and you're eligible until you reach 80% or less compared to the prior quarter. ERC 2020 is open up for businesses that have 100 employees or less. If you are 100 or more, there are some stipulations there, meaning that you're only able to take the wages that you paid for when the employee wasn't working. So maybe you paid them a salary, but they weren't really working, they were at home. The ERC credit, as a reminder, was $10,000 of maximum wages qualified you for a maximum 50% credit, which is $5,000 per employee. So if you were able to attribute $10,000 for five employees, you're looking at a $25,000 credit coming back on your 941. Um, can you elect to take the credit for some wages? Yes, and you are able to mix with PPP and ERC. What you just wanna make sure for is that you're not double dipping, no double dipping. So if, if you are attributing for loan forgiveness an employee's wage, a 5,000 and there's 5,000 remaining, you can split them both to maximize your PPP and ERC. So that's for 2020. For 2021, there is a, um, if you can go back. So for 2021, the gross receipts test is a little bit easier. You only had to have show a 20% reduction over the prior quarter and it increased it for organizations up to 500 employees. So instead of having to dabble at this 100, now you had a 500 exemption. Partial government shutdown and gross receipts were still the same, but they've increased the credit now. So now you're able to take $10,000 per employee per quarter for a maximum of $7,000. Now, Again, as a reminder, PPP and ERC can go together. You just can't attribute the same wages for one employee to both PPP and ERC. You need to be able to clearly state to the IRS that you have not double dipped. But as you can see, now you can get a, a maximum of $7,000 per employee per quarter. And we're expecting them to potentially continue this through Q3 and Q4. Right now, we're, oh, it's just open for Q1 2021 and Q2 2021. Um, so those are um, similar to PPP. PPP is cash now, right? You can apply, and as Orion said, there's a little bit of a wait, but you're able to get cash in, into the organization. ERTC, if you're going to go back and amend, it's going to be about 16 weeks before you receive the credit. For 2021, I would advise looking at ERC before you complete your Q1 941s. Um, much easier and the credit is more real time. If we need to amend to get you the money back that you've already admitted to the IRS, it'll be about 16 weeks for them to get through the pipeline. Um, so overall, ERC is a great opportunity if you do not need to use all of your wages for PPP um, to get some extra money back on the table. Very good. And I know we've got some appendixes, but mostly that's to just share out. So I'd love to open it up to questions, PPP, ERC, in general. And, and I could just kind of go through just a couple of like kind of high level examples on how the PPP, if you kind of want to do a rough calculation, let's say, um, let's say that you're a business and you have $200,000 of wages last year, you could you could basically take about 20% of that. So that would be what, $40,000? And that would be a PPP loan right there based on that. Um, so just a real rough calculation about 20% of your actual wages. I mean, there's there's different different little nuances there, but that's sort of a rough way to kind of get a calculation on what the potential PPP loan amount could be. Um, hey, Keaton, this is Liz. And, you know, similar to uh, last year, I'm just curious whether uh, your team is willing to take any like one-off calls from partners, because obviously we'll be pushing this recording out uh, to our partner list. 
And I think last year you just kind of kept track if there was an ACH partner that called and asked you specific questions. Yeah. Uh, Cause we'd like to let them know that if they've got questions that uh, we would cover, you know, the cost of you just getting on a phone and, and helping them through some of the simple parts. Is that yep. still an option this time? Yep, absolutely. And I can act as the, as the point person there. And if it's uh, something I don't know, get you connected with the right person, but but we've, uh, as you've heard from Brittany and O'Ryan and, and then others internally, um, we've tried to break up this CARES Act and all this money and funding into different buckets within our firm so that someone uh, is the expert on each. And man, that was, that was hard back in March and April to gather everything so quickly, but we've had time now. So, um, so yeah, we have a, we've heard just about everything, but I'd love to have some more surprises too. Okay, well, great. And, you know, maybe we'll have... Uh... Cassie or Megan be on point for partners and then connect them with you. So that'd be really awesome. Thanks. Yeah, sounds good. Looks like Susan might have a question and then Jackie. So Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Hit my mute button here. Just want to make sure my understanding of my calculations is correct. So we're talking gross wages plus employer contributions to their retirement plan plus state unemployment plus family medical care act plus labor and industries tax um so yep all the employer paid amounts for the for the for those except for the l and i amount i would say are correct the l and i amount would be um i have not seen any direct guidance from the l and i from the sba um so i would so from my if I'm being like conservative, I probably would not include the LNI on there because um, there, there I have not seen any direct guidance from the actual SBA guidance. Yeah, on it's that. one of it's one of our big taxes because at home health, it's almost um, eighty-five cents an hour. That's right. Yep, and, and that's where it kind of gets into the kind of the gray area is because it's based on hours versus compensation only. Gotcha. And the oh, actual absolutely. and the actual guidance is it's based on compensation taxes based on compensation employer pay. all right so Versus, no LNI. There's a, I, if the ones i'm doing i'm not including l and i because of that reason and i've we've conferred with other cpas and they, they agree with that awesome thank you i'm so glad i asked you bet yeah but just give me a little bit smaller loan unfortunately but um i guess from my point of view it, it just makes me feel better about it than, than, than figuring out later it's not qualified and I love my role here because I get to play the devil's advocate. I, I totally agree. What Ryan said is just correct. Um, never hurts to check with your bank and say, hey, can we include l and I? And you might get a day where they say yes. And you document that. And that's informal. Right. Hey, Jackie, how are you doing? Why don't you go ahead? Hi, all. Thank you. Um, my question is around eligibility. So at the beginning, um, you all started, you were going over that and some of the things I'm just curious, our organization, we've been um, operational, I wanna say about a year and a half up and before that we were an all volunteer led organization. So we're in a huge you know, transition in this COVID. And so I'm just curious that being the case, like our numbers haven't decreased based on where we are as an organization, right? They're showing like the opposite. Does that? Yeah, so yeah. So it's a, so would this be a PPP one or PPP two? So has it, have you guys applied before? Or? No, we have not applied. Okay. So there, so the SBA has put up something pretty vague on, on what, what kind of qualifies out and what it, they say is a good faith requirement. And that means that you, there, that there's enough uncertainty out there. So their actual language is there's a good faith requirement that your there's current economic uncertainty that makes the loan request necessary to support the ongoing oper operations of the applicant. Um, that is that is their guidance on the requirement for a PPP one. And so they gave one example out there, which is if you're a publicly traded company, so you have people that can put money in and buy your stock, that would be one that you're probably not going to qualify for because you can raise money pretty easily to support ongoing operations. Um, other than that, they have not, there's not, in the last year, there's not any other guidance on what that means in other good faith. I think 
for clients that are kind of on the fence, it's kind of looking at, okay, um, you have employees and you, maybe your operations are maybe even growing, but overall, is there, is there still something where it's, there's uncertainty in your, your operations where having this would provide, you know, making sure that your employees are paid and retained. Um, and it's easier for some industries more than others. So, you know, restaurant, hospitals, very easy to, to argue that. Um, or other ones, it sort of, have, it really depends on, on the, you know, the people, management and, and the board to kind of make that decision. So unfortunately, there's not like a bright line test. It's just kind of vague guidance on a good faith um, need. You know, Ryan, you're talking round one still? Talk. That's right, yeah. Round I mean, one and round two both have that the same thing. I see. Okay. Can you you can't still apply for round one, can you? You can, yep. Yeah. So so basically round one, so round one and round two. So it's called round two, right? But you can be a first draw or second draw borrower. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So first draw and second draw. There's and the second draw is where you have to have that gross receipts decrease. But the first draw, you don't need that gross receipts decrease. You can oh. have your gross receipts increase and just feel like there could be uncertainty out there, document that, make sure you have employees. And then, you know, when that money comes in, use all that for your employee compensation. And that proves that you're using it for what you need to. I think in that case, you know, you're, you're showing that you're using it for your employees. You're not like taking a huge, let's say it's a company, dividend out to the shareholders like that. I think in that case, you'd be kind of on the, in, having a tough time proving it's a good faith thing. But if you're using that money for your employees, I mean, I think that that's, that's good faith. There's uncertainty out there. You can document that. Um, but I think that's one way to, to feel better about that good faith requirement. Great clarifier there, Orion. I, so I, I, is it fair to say that if you're a first time PPP drawer from this new pool of money, but you haven't had PPP, it's basically the same test as it was back in April of last year. That that's right. Yep. I would say it's probably even a little bit less, uh, a less, um, I think it was a little bit more harder to kind of get over that first time. I think it, they've loosened it up a little bit where they're, they're not looking, the SBA is probably not as stringent on it the second time, but the, the actual guidance out there is still the same where it's just good faith, good faith requirement. Yeah. So, so Jackie, is that helping? Yeah, that, that was super helpful. Like, it sounds like there's some flexibility that could perhaps right work in our favor. So thank you for clarifying. And, and yeah. if, I'm, if I'm hearing it correctly, it sounds like since the funds weren't exhausted in PPP version one, that folks can actually still apply for that, which had different requirements around it, or they could be a first time or second time in the PPP version two. So, so the PP, so the first PPP loan, the first PPP program was depleted, but they've opened up the second one, but it's open to first time applicants and second time applicants and first time applicants, they don't have to meet like a gross revenue decrease. Gotcha. To apply. Okay. Yep. Okay. This is Megan. I, I have a question. <laughs> um, so if you haven't applied before, so you're a first time applicant, but applying under this round two and, and say you just kind of missed the boat on the first round, could you potentially apply twice under this round two? Is that something that would be possible? Yep. Yes, you can. But the, the time, the, sorry, my dog's barking in the background. The situation <laughs> would be, there's not enough time to do it because if you were to get it now, gotcha. There's a there's that eight week minimum that you'd have to have that money to spend it out that covered okay. it. and then so that would unless they extend it so if they extend it then I would say yes right yeah. so for those who maybe hadn't applied the first time just keep your eyes and ears open in case they do extend it I I got one more question for you for for um agencies that have already received the first round and they're being told by their banks, you know, uh, wait, you can't apply for forgiveness yet. Just wait, wait, wait. Is, what would happen if um, they were still not eligible or their banks were still not letting them apply for forgiveness by the time their loan would potentially start accruing interest? If it was all forgivable, would it not matter that they got it in, you know, past that date that interest started accruing or how would that, or are we just kind of assuming that wouldn't happen even though we're getting kind of close to that point? 
Yeah, so um, the SBA did put a pause on, on accepting forgiveness applications because I think that they're really focusing all their, all their efforts on getting this next, this round right now out the door. Um, okay. So they, I think they've either reopened it soon or maybe this week, I think it's coming up if anything. So basically but, banks can process it and they can get it ready, but they, they cannot submit it to the SBA. This SBA can't like process it yet. Gotcha, but um, that would never like negatively impact a, a business who's trying to apply forgiveness. They would never start potentially accruing interest in, in that right. time. Yeah, and so I, there, I believe there's a, I wanna say it's a 10 month window after so that covered period ends. And so if I were to, I don't have it in front of me, but I believe that most applicants that would have received it last year, I think they have until, I wanna say at least the end of the summer before mm -hmm. that those payments would be due. Um, and so, okay. if, but that'd be something definitely to look into. I just don't know that the exact dates offhand um, for, the, for the forgiveness part, but, um, you know, it's, if it's been a, if it's kind of getting close, I would definitely get the forgiveness kicked off. If you, and look at that ERC that Brittany was talking about, if, if you qualify for the ERC, that's where the forgiveness application, you'd really want to make sure that that is balancing the two different programs because you could utilize both the programs by not double dipping the wages. Um, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And so oh, Ryan, I have the dates if you want me to share. That'd be great. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So if your loan was funded in April of 2020, um, the end of the payment deferral, meaning 24 weeks plus 10 months would be August 2021. And then so okay. from there, you can add a month. So April 2020 would be August 2021. And then August 2020 would be December 2021. And then you just kind of add a month um, through there. I'll try to put a snippet in the in the chat. Excellent. Thank you. So, Thank yeah, you. so the, the earliest right now would be the August date, um, you know, which can come pretty quick. It does take a, I know for us, like when we work on them, it, it does take a week or two to get those out the door um, because there are all, you have to collect all the documentation to pay on the loan amount and get that started. But that's way better than I was realizing. So no need to really worry too much yet, I suppose. Yep. Yeah, it's not going to happen in the next couple of weeks. Definitely. Yep. You got a couple of months. Thank you. Hey, but and I think a copy of the slides we should be able to provide those. Um, up. Yep. Awesome. This was really helpful. Uh, thank you guys so much. I know we had, you know, a few partners that uh, reached out to you after the call we did last spring, and. Uh, I anticipate that that'll happen again, but you know, just always really helpful to be able to pick the brains of the Larson Groves team. Yeah, thanks for having us, Liz. We, we this is what we're doing. It's it not doesn't take much time to prepare. It's it's fresh on our brains, and we're happy to do it. And yeah, for anyone here, or certainly if this gets pushed out, anyone else, feel free to reach out with questions. And as like a, a final sing of praise, this employee retention credit. Don't overlook it. It's a lot of it's a lot of words, and I'm looking at those people who got all their applications in for forgiveness in December, and are thinking, ah, oh, why did I put all my payroll in there? Now, now I could have put in this other stuff, and and so you're kind of lucky if you haven't put in your application if you qualified for the ERC. So not everyone will, but if you do, it's a pretty pretty significant extra benefit uh, that all of a sudden just showed up. You can do this too, so um, be thinking about it. Can I say one other thing about that, Keaton, and maybe everybody else will know, this is Megan, but maybe everybody else will know a little bit more than I did. But when you guys first started to talk about it, all I could think about was the credit for qualified family leave wages, which I realize now it's not the same, right, at all. Um, but they're both on the same form. Is that true? Like you would apply for the retention credit on that same, I want to just clarify yeah. that. There's lots of free money out there, I feel like. Yes. Yeah. so um, today we spoke about PPP and employee retention credit. When you look at your 941s, there is something called the FFCRA. So that's the Family First um, Credit Leave Act. And so that one, yes, it would go 
On the 941, or our position is if you have payroll wages, you allocate forgiveness for PPP, you have to take out FFCRA, and then if you have anything left, you can take that amount for employee retention credit. Perfect, okay. Yes, FFCRA on the 941 trumps employee tension credit. It does not trump PPP. Okay, great. Yep. So here's what sense. I heard. A really more letter-filled complication than A plus B equals C. So <laughs> <laughs> the last like minute and a half was just like kind of blew my mind because obviously we've had people taking <laughs> the family's first uh, paid time off and all that jazz too. So I, I think you should draw a picture of that. <laughs> we, will, we will take that into into consideration get our artists going yeah it's it's a lot there's a lot out there um and it's all wage related right and no double dipping and no none of that so let us know if you have questions we're happy to look at your specific example well and you know and i i want i do just want to go back to jackie's question just for a minute because you know there are a couple of ach partners who, you know, I'm going to say in that 2019, 2020, because of investments that were being made to help build up their organizations, it just may not see themselves as eligible because they didn't take a dip. And even though they were facing, you know, some pretty severe challenges, um, you know, I just really appreciated both Jackie's question and the framing of that because you know, there, there are just a couple of others who I think also kind of fit into that category and, and just may not have been seeing themselves, you know, in this loan and forgiveness and credit opportunity. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. And back in April, like Orion was saying, um, you know, it might be even a little bit easier if it's your first draw right now. That's true. Back in April, though, there was still, remember how much unknown there was yeah. certainly we're in a different slot today. And so you might, you might've been an organization who ended up doing way better. That could have signed that back in April saying, we have no idea. Um, maybe some of those today wouldn't feel com comfortable signing that. Um, but you're, you know, if you are making that investment, there still remains that uncertainty. Absolutely. It's available to you. Yeah. All right. Any last Comments, our team, Larson Gross team, partners. Just thank you very much. This has been really helpful. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank, thank you for, for everyone's time. It's been a good good to present this and happy to hear. I hope that I hope to hear the, some new loans come out through Keaton um, that you guys apply for and or your partners apply for. I think it's a it's a you know it's a tough situation for everybody, the whole nation, and this is one way that. You know, it's a very unique situation that probably won't, hopefully not, we won't have to encounter again. And so if, if you guys are able to take the opportunity and it makes sense, then that'd be great to hear um, any sort of success stories from us. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much. And Cassie, thanks for uh, managing the recording, et cetera. So um, more to come. <laughs>